Welcome to the Cross Border Interview Podcast, a podcast about getting out from behind the keyboard and just talking. Each week, we invite a guest or two to sit down and talk about their life and their work. I'm Christopher Brown, your host, and this is the Cross Border Interview Podcast featuring the 19th Prime Minister of Canada, the Right Honorable Kim Campbell. Quiet. Okay, here we go. Perfect. Thank you very much, Madam Campbell, for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Um, I, w- I won't take much of your time, so we'll dive right into the uh, this interview. My first question to everyone on the show is, where did or does your sense of duty come from? Well, it's a question I've often been asked, and it's an easy one to answer, because I'm the daughter of two World War II veterans. Uh, my father was in the Canadian Army, fought in Italy, and was wounded there. His best friend was killed there, and in fact is, is buried in the Canadian Military Cemetery at Ravenna. And I grew up hearing his story, but my mother horrified her mother by uh, enlisting in the Wrens. I think she might have lied about her age. And this is 1943, and was trained as a wireless telegrapher and was posted to track the radio transmissions of German U-boats in the North Atlantic and Gulf of St. Lawrence. So she was in Halifax and Moncton, Santia, Saint Quebec and uh, and Ottawa. So, uh, and we had our little Morse codes, uh, little, uh, what do you call that thing? The little, not the hammer, but the Anyway, it'll come to me in a second. Uh, Devices, and we, you know, I grew up knowing that it did da 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 that it did that that was SOS. So anyway, I grew up with the belief that both um, my parents served and that both men and women could serve. But also because I was born after World War II, but right in its aftermath in 1947, you know, World War II was. You know, such a preoccupation where there are documentaries on TV and movies and books and whatever. Uh, and then I read a lot about the Holocaust. And, and I guess I wanted to live a life outside just my own little life and to try to be part of some process that would keep something as terrible as World War II happening again. So I felt this sense that you had to uh, not just live your own little private life, but to be connected to the big picture. And that's, I think, where where it came from. The sense of responsibility, that we were responsible and that I wanted to be part of that. Now, growing up, did your father instill that upon you to have that sense of responsibility to give back to the community as much as you can as a, uh, as a veteran of a war? I don't think either of my parents uh, taught that or articulated it as a conscious message. I think it was something I simply observed. Um, as he got, when he got older, my dad got quite involved in veterans affairs. I mean, he was always, you know, connected to veterans organizations, but when he uh, got, got quite a bit older, he became active in the national organization of his, of his club. And, uh, and in fact, when I was minister of justice, when I became the political minister for British Columbia, and laid the wreath of the uh, for the government of Canada at the Cenotaph in Vancouver on Remembrance Day. Uh, my father was there laying the wreath too, and it was kind of a very nice experience for the two of us together to do this. So, um, but I don't think it was ever anything specifically. It was just it was in the atmosphere and the example of my parents that that this was something that both of them had done, and um, that it was what you did. So now what. <laughs> For someone who is a public figure like yourself, uh, how did you get into politics? Was it a simple decision on your part to get into politics? I know your story from high school. You were the first female student body uh, uh, president for your high school. But to go into elected politics in a public way, that's a unique way to serve your community. Was it an easy decision for yourself to get involved with the school board of Vancouver when you were first elected? Well, it was kind of serendipitous. When I was a teenager, I wanted to be the first woman secretary general of the UN, because that seemed to me in terms of, you know, preventing World War Three, perhaps a more useful thing. And I wasn't, I didn't think of going into politics. Um, there were no politicians in my family. My parents both voted, um, but I had no role models in a sense, and there weren't many women in politics. Um, and it, it, it sort of happened serendipitously. In my first marriage, my first husband, Nathan Davinsky, was a mathematician. And he got involved on the Vancouver School Board. He, he served several terms on the school board. And when he wanted to run for city council, his colleagues came to me and said, um, 
would you run for the school board? And by that time, I was teaching at UBC, and I'll open a little square bracket there because I had a student who also influenced my my, uh, my views of politics. So I'll come back to that. But um, I said, by that time, you know, I had some views about, you know, how well my students were trained to do university work, and I had some opinions. I don't know how well founded they were, but, you know, we all have opinions. So I thought, well, you know, I've been thinking about doing politics and maybe this was an opportunity for me to find out whether I was cut out for it. Uh, Because in municipal politics, you do everything and you don't go someplace else to serve your constituents. So you face the full brunt of all of that. So I agreed that I would run. But then they were horrified because Campbell is my maiden name and it's the name I've always used professionally. And I I think they hoped I would run because if I used my married name, I could, you know, fly in on the coattails of my well-known and well-established husband. But I said, I don't use my married name professionally, and it'd be quite dishonest of me to do that. I don't mind if people know that we're married, but, you know, it's not what I would do. So they also sort of kind of po-faced and thought, oh, dear, well, so much for that idea. But anyway, so I ran and he ran and we both got elected. He to city council and me to the school board. And I actually got more votes than he did. So um, <laughs> that was interesting. And But when I was teaching at UBC, I had a student named Andy Stark, who is now a very distinguished senior professor, probably, probably ready to retire at the University of Alberta. He went off to Harvard to do his PhD, a very smart uh, young man. And he... <laughs> and was at that time president of the Young Progressive Conservatives. And he gave me some of Bob Stanfield's speeches, which I thought were very thoughtful. And I said to him one day, you know, I've thought of going into politics, um, but I'm not involved with the party. And he said, well, if you want to go into politics, don't get involved in a party, become a star. And what he meant was become somebody that parties will come to, to run, as opposed to uh, you know, and particularly for a woman, I think of Flora McDonald, who was who ran for leadership of the Progressive Conservatives, and she was very smart and able. But because she had sort of started out as a party secretary and working, people couldn't shift their mindset. You know, Flora from being you know good old Flora doing all the stuff that needed to be done to Flora actually holding elected office and perhaps leading our party, which she was eminently qualified to do. So he said, you know, become a star. And so actually, my my involvement in municipal politics was the beginning of that because it created a profile. It gave me a chance, first of all, to learn whether I was suited to it, and I found I loved it. So it, that, it kind of grew from there. And then I was asked to run in, in what I call my kamikaze run in Vancouver Center. I was asked to be a candidate at a provincial election in 1983. And I actually was a candidate while I was reading my law school finals. I was lesson number one. Okay, Kim, do not put your own career at risk to satisfy somebody else's because happily I graduated from law school and that was all fine. But um, but that also drew my attention, me to the attention of the premier who, who was very grateful that I had run, not because we could win, because it was a two-member riding, but because it sort of tied down the the NDP members of that riding. It was a pretty safe NDP seat. Um, And so I was invited to come and be the uh, executive director of the premier's office, my only political staffing job. And that convinced me that I wasn't cut out to be a political staffer, that I liked actually being the hands-on person, going out there doing things, meeting the folks, etc. And uh, I ran for the social credit leadership, uh, and it's a, whole, it's a whole long story, I won't get into the details of that. Uh, and that also raised my profile considerably, which enabled me to get a nomination in the following provincial election and to be elected as an MLA. I did not, however, I was not a soulmate of Premier Vanderzam, who succeeded my old boss, Bill Bennett, as leader of the party. And in 1988, uh, when the federal election came, Pat Carney did not want to run again in Vancouver Center. And she said to people, the only person who could hold this seat is Kim Campbell. And I had not been thought of running federally, but I, I began to feel that I was at a dead end provincially. I didn't get on well with the premier and I wasn't going to be able to accomplish very much. So I thought, well, you know. Maybe this is something I should try to do because if the government is returned, I'll have a chance to do something. And if I don't win and they aren't returned, you know, no big deal. So three weeks into the election, I was nominated as the candidate for the Progressive Conservatives in Vancouver Center, and I won. 
And even though I was running running against two quite strong candidates, uh, Jonathan Hertog for the NDP and Tex Enemark for the Liberals, uh, and you know, I just got across. If the election had been held later, I'd have won by even more. <laughs> but how my trajectory went up, and on election day, I won by a very thin margin, uh, but became the member of parliament for Vancouver Centre, and. Um, I had come to the attention of people in the party and the prime minister's office. And when he had, I was told that when he came to do an event in my in my riding during the election, that after I'd introduced him, et cetera, his wife said to him, I think you've met your successor. But I don't know if that's true. That could be apocryphal. But, um, but anyway, so when the prime minister created his first new cabinet at the beginning of 1989, we were elected in the fall of 88, I was appointed to cabinet as the junior minister for Indian affairs and the prime minister said this was to give me a chance to get my feet wet without having a lot of media attention because I had a senior minister uh, uh, could do. so um, just anyway. to interrupt here for a second when you, ran, no, yeah. <laughs> when you ran in 88 did you expect to be appointed to cabinet or was there a chance that you thought, you know what, I'm just going to go, I'm going to serve my constituents in Ottawa uh, as best as I can. And cabinet, if it comes, I'll be happy, but it's not a top priority for me. Well, I think what you said is how I felt. I remember asking my campaign manager, David Camp, if he thought that I would have a chance to be in cabinet. And he said to me, I think with your your skills and abilities, you should reasonably expect to become prime minister, which was, again, something that was very weird to me. But, but you know, cabinet is a lot of it's the luck of the draw. In British Columbia, there were four cabinet ministers. Two of them did not return. One of them was defeated, Jerry St. Germain, and the other one, Pat Carney. Uh, did not run again. So there was a possibility for two new cabinet ministers from British Columbia, and Mary Collins and I were appointed to cabinet. We held almost all the seats in Alberta, I think all but two or three, and there were a lot of really talented young people in the Alberta caucus, but there were three cabinet ministers from Alberta, Joe Clark, Harvey Andre, and um, uh, Don Mazinkowski. And they were reelected. So there wasn't really a vacancy. You know, there's a certain allocation of seats. So that so you like to think you're chosen because you're brilliant and clever and leaving tall buildings in a single band. But sometimes it's just a question of whether the prime minister can actually appoint you uh, if there are, you know, because he has to balance the regional representation is very important. So it was the luck of the draw that I happened to run when there was a possibility for the prime minister to choose two new ministers in British Columbia, and I was one of them. You have said uh, in the uh, in past interviews that I've uh, listened to you from, um, uh, on you, uh, Madam Campbell, that your your introduction to politics sort of came in your university days about how men would go off to Ottawa and become staffers while women would stay in uh, their writings and become volunteers for the executives. Was that a draw into politics for yourself to say, you know what, I need to break the glass ceiling here to quote Hillary Clinton. I need to break the glass ceiling. I need to be at be a person who can be counted on as a woman, but also as a candidate. Well, I think that's a much more coherent expression of things than I had at that time. I was very young. Uh, but when I was an undergraduate, I got involved in the student government. Again, when I came up from high school, I was elected freshman president, and then I became a vice president. Two years later, I became vice president of the Alma Mater Society, and then I realized um, I really ought to graduate, so I gave up the campus politics and focused on, on doing a degree in honors political science. But um, but I, it wasn't that I made a choice. I just It just didn't appeal to me. I thought, you know, campus political clubs were not places that were congenial to young women. Uh, nobody saw you as, you know, perhaps going on to a great political career. So some of my female colleagues had, had gone that route, but it just didn't appeal to me because, you know, first of all, uh, the the men I, I knew who were politically active, particularly in the Liberal Party, you know, there was a certain amount of hubris. And as, you, as I said before in other interviews, you know, they got to go off to Ottawa and work for cabinet ministers and stuff. And I didn't know any women who did that, uh, who were invited to do that. So it just wasn't very appealing to me. But also at that stage when I was an undergraduate, I hadn't yet thought about going into politics. I was still hoping to be Secretary General of the UN, although I had no idea how you did that. So I was studying international politics 
Um, and then I went to graduate school at the London School of Economics and did Soviet government and traveled in the Soviet Union and did all sorts of interesting things there. So my focus was not on uh, elected office because, as I say, there had been nothing that had attracted me, nor had anybody said, you're just the person for us. And uh, I had to do that on my own. So. You, you've also mentioned that in the 60s and 70s, men uh, in places of power would look at women as interlopers. Can you explain what you meant by that? Because uh, for me, I'm looking at it as that that comment and thinking, OK, I, I, I was not born in the 60s. I was not born in the 70s. So I don't know what women would have gone through unless I read a history book. But as someone who went through it, did you feel like an interloper when you were going through your days of uh, as an MLA in B.C., as a day? from your days as the school board trustee and in law school? Well, let's sort of rewind it a little bit. When I was applying to graduate school, it was still at a time when a lot of men thought women were taking posts that should go to men. You know, and you'd get asked, well, you know, so we give you this fellowship, you know, and you go to graduate school, you're just going to get married and have family and you're not going to do things, which is total BS. All sorts of, you know, brilliant women have done both. And, uh, and many of them I count as my friends. And I just was at a dinner last year where there were two women, an American and a Canadian, who won the Nobel Prizes in physics and chemistry in 2018. And both of them happened to be married and have families. And jeepers, they managed to do it. But the assumption was... That, that women were sort of interlopers, that we were taking things that rightfully belonged to men. Um, and I think um, in that sense, you know, there was this issue that women didn't really belong and you know, the parliament was sort of a man's world and that this was something that men did and women, you know, where did you belong? But also because when women championed issues uh, related to to their own rights, related to families, related to children, these were considered kind of fringe issues, you know, and the men would say things like, well, let us solve the hard problems and then we'll get to women's issues. Nobody would say that now because those issues are actually fundamental to the well-being of society. You can't separate them out. But the mentality was really very condescending to women, that women weren't really, women were kind of an afterthought. The default category was men. Issues related to men, you know, and, um, you know, and, and now, uh, you know, I think the work I've done since I left office working on uh, getting women involved in negotiations, post-conflict negotiations of the resolutions of the U.N. Security Council uh, for, you know, that, that women must be part of post-conflict negotiations. I mean, that, that why? Because peace agreements don't last if you know, they are not negotiated with the full participation and, and taking into account things that women may identify that men won't. So we've now come to the point where people are coming to understand that this is not something you do to be nice to the ladies. It's that in a society, you cannot create laws and policies and ways of doing things that totally ignore the reality of half the population. So, so but in, in those days, you know, we were there on sufferance. You know, so somebody like Margaret Thatcher comes along, you know, and, you know, she's one of these, you know, when you know, like, like, like Golda Meir, you know, the only man in the cabinet, you know, so that you know, women who were allowed to be anomalies, you know, there were exceptions to the rule. Uh, but, you know, many women would criticize Margaret Thatcher for not being more supportive of other women, but I don't think she could. I think if she was seen as the thin edge of a female wedge, it would have been much harder for her. The fact that she was very much, you know, a loner and sort of, you know, she, she felt that everything that she'd accomplished was a bit like, like men that way, that, you know, kind of not recognizing whatever privileges she may have had that helped her get there. But she did overcome a lot. But she couldn't really be an advocate. She was a generation ahead of me. Um, and it's easier now for women to have solidarity because their right to participate, both as a reflection of laws and policies that protect them and the reality of their presence on the landscape makes it easier for them to embrace the cause of other women and open the door. But 
while I agree that today society women's perspectives need to be heard and they should be elected, do you, do you believe that society looks as look at women who want to get into politics as still an interloper? You should be still staying at home and uh, looking after the family. You don't have the time to go into politics because you see time and time again with social media when women get involved in politics, the trolls come out and start attacking. So do you think society well, yeah. has changed and women are no longer viewed as an interloper? Well, it's interesting because there are many people who think women make outstanding politicians, and that includes men. Um, you know, I've met in a number of contexts men who, who have said, you know, I wish we were just governed by women because they get it and they're full of sense and they're not big egos and they make the right decisions. And there's some, been some interesting conversations about how the countries that are led by women and during this COVID emergency are actually doing better. Uh, are much more successful in controlling the virus and in mobilizing their populations, etc. Um, so it depends. But if if you look at the resurgence of right wing thinking, and this really worries me, resurgent authoritarianism, all of that and 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 fascist beliefs, etc., are also founded. They tend to be racist and sexist, and they're founded on this notion that you know Hitler articulated Kinder, Kuche, Kirche, that women we you know should have children, kitchen, and church, and stay out of the way, um, and this notion of uh, women as being having their fundamental role is you know raising the future little brown shoots of tomorrow. That's very much linked to a whole range of political views that are not very democratic, that are very authoritarian and hierarchical. And where to the extent that social media has provided avenues for people who think that way to express themselves more, and to the extent that Donald Trump has given people permission to be quite misogynist, those, the articulation of those views is getting more, more profile. But there are, I think, more people who don't share those views and who understand the importance of gender equality and, and participation. It doesn't mean that looking after children is not a challenge and that you know, working women don't have you know, work-life balance issues as do men. But the value that women bring, there's all sorts of research. It's funny, there's interesting research that shows that when you test people for the qualities that make a good leader, women do better. There's all sorts of research that shows that diversity in decision making, both gender diversity and diversity of other kinds, different kind of mindsets, makes much better decisions. I mean, the science supporting uh, equality, the science supporting diversity is now, you know, pushing back against notions that you could have an optimal society where you exclude certain people from participating. And the problem is that people often have very false ideas about what women have contributed. When I was young, people said to me, well, Kim, you know, you're really smart, but you know, where is the female Mozart and where is the female Einstein? Well, you know, they actually do exist. Mozart's older sister was a brilliant musician. He looked up to her. And, but when she reached puberty, her father decided that she should not she should get off the touring that they were doing and go home because you know this wasn't now for her, even though she was as much a star and uh, Mozart was as much a star as he was. So he got all the attention and he got the chance to become what we call Mozart now. But she was incredibly brilliant. Um, there are women scientists, uh, physicists, and mathematicians whose work is foundational for modern science. Emmy Neuter, people like that. If you go on the website of the Prism Institute, per, sorry, the Perimeter Institute in Canada, they have a whole area about women in science. And there are all sorts of these women whose work was outstanding, but we don't learn about them. We don't hear about them. There are men, male physicists who've never heard of Emmy Neuter, whom Einstein regarded as an equal, thought she was one of the most brilliant scientists ever. Uh, she died young at 40 of a botched uh, operation. But we don't hear about the movie, Hidden Figures, the role that the, those African-American mathematicians played in creating the space program. And I watched this film and I'm enraged because I said, why don't we know about them? And look what they had to deal with, both in terms of their race and their gender. So. We, when we are, there are people we think don't belong. One of the problems of being seen as an interloper um, is that people want to erase your contribution. So the impression people have is that the landscape of the people who made our modern society, made all the contributions, is, is populated by men. And it's not true. So we include women, as I say, not to be nice to the ladies, 
but to create an accurate depiction of how we got here, who's made the contributions, and therefore why it matters to ensure that talented people, irrespective of their gender or race or whatever, get a chance to keep contributing in this very difficult world where we can't afford to afford to waste brains and talent. Well, and I think you're right, because you do mention in a speech that you gave on uh, uh, gender equality in the Senate that Canada even was founded by women as well. And that is not well known because you say that the Hudson Bay Company, men would come over from Europe and they would take indigenous wives. But we would never we never learned about the indigenous wives who helped the Hudson Bay Company form Canada and what we have now, because they don't want they want to take all the glory. Men want to take all the glory and women can just be pushed to the background. And that's what history is. But also, there is also an unsavory side of it that many of these men took indigenous wives and children with them. And the women were very smart and they played a very important role as liaisons between the indigenous and the, uh, the European communities. But also when the men had made their stash, you know, they went back to Europe and they usually didn't take their indigenous wives with them. So there was a form of exploitation and, and, uh, uh, you know, not very attractive uh, denigration and, and loss of status for women. But the role that they played was very important. And you look at, you know, if you ever go to Quebec City and you go to the, the old Ursuline convent there, and, you know, these women, these widows from France would come supposedly to educate the savages, and happily the savages educated them on how to survive in that very difficult, difficult climate. But these were remarkable women who came and, you know, brought you know, education and nursing and social uh, uh, services to the new uh, European settlements there. And, you know, talking about being plucky, I mean, I'm not sure I'd have gotten one of those little bathtubs across the Atlantic with, you know, to see the quelques arpents de neige, as Voltaire described it, you know, several acres of snow, which is about all it was. So how, how do we change that? How do we change the how do we get uh, our generations that are coming up now who are in school to learn more about the female impact on Canada? Because if you read textbooks, women are talked about probably about 20 percent out of the whole out of your history textbooks. Well, as I say, the, the only way that we will have a more uh, fair and inclusive uh, future is if we have a more fair and inclusive history. And it's not just women who are excluded, it's indigenous people, it's people of color. You know, the New York Times created a new feature in its obituary column a few years ago. They've been uh, publishing obituaries since about 1850. And they said, we realize that all the articles that we published have basically been about white men, and that there are thousands of lives that were incredibly important that were not celebrated. Uh, women, people of color, uh, people who just didn't fit into the, 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 the biases of New York Times editors of who deserved to have their lives memorialized. And so and you can go on the New York Times and their, their, their website and their obituary and look for um, overlooked no more. That is the category. And they write about extraordinary people. And you read these and you say, why didn't I know about this person? Uh, and it could be a person of color. It could be a woman. It could be somebody of, of another, you know, it could be an Asian person or an indigenous person. And we are so cheated. We're cheated of our role models. So, you know, how do, you know, young African-Americans, if they don't know how many incredibly brilliant African-Americans there have been in American society, people who've done all sorts of amazing things in all sorts of fields, including science and medicine and technology and whatever. There used to be a little comic strip uh, that um, that was about African-American people. And uh, in, in Black Awareness Month or, or whatever they called it, they would do little things about people, uh, uh, you know, black people who had made important contributions like the inventor of the heart-lung machine and, and you know, all these kinds of things. Um, and I used to enjoy reading that because I think, I don't know this. But if we don't know, if all we ever see are people, if we white people, all we ever see is people who look like us or the male versions of us, and we think that those are the people who've made all the discoveries, well, why wouldn't we absorb a subliminal message of gender superiority, racial superiority. So we have to tell the stories. We have to change the landscape from which people get their sense of how the world works. So that includes a much more inclusive history, a much more thoughtful history, but also 
when we open people up, you know, I say to people, I, you know, I, many people think I was the shortest serving prime minister in Canada because it suits their narrative because I was a woman and I didn't win the general election. But I am not the shortest serving prime minister of Canada. I'm not even the second shortest serving prime minister of Canada. I am the third shortest serving prime minister of Canada. But the two men who had shorter terms than I had, John Turner and, and uh, Charles Tupper, nobody suggests, you know, taking their portraits down from parliament. You know, John Turner never won a general election. Uh, why would you, why, you know, but it's the assumption is that I'm the anomaly. So I don't want to make a career out of being a former prime minister. But, you know, nobody since me, no woman since me, has been elected leader of a party that could form a government. And in fact, since I was prime minister, there have been about 15 or 16 changes of leadership in Canadian political parties that had a chance to form a government. And in none of those changes of leadership has a woman been chosen or even a woman been on a final ballot. So it was actually a pretty big accomplishment to do that. And let me tell you, when I ran for the leadership of my party in uh, 1993, a lot of my male colleagues wanted the job. We knew that it was going to be very tough. You know, our Quebec vote had been taken off by Lucien Bouchard. The Reform Party in Alberta was eroding our Western vote. The chances of our winning the election were very small. But the prize of that particular campaign, the leadership campaign, and I wasn't appointed leader. I, I was elected leader of the party in a very tough national campaign. But the, the, the prize of that campaign was whoever won would become prime minister because we were the governing party. And there was, it was, there was no question of people saying, oh, well, let Kim do it. They wanted to do it. Now, a lot of people knew that the chances of winning were very small. But if a man had been elected leader and it had the same result, because it was really very difficult. The, the math was just all wrong because, as I say, our Quebec vote and the Western vote. I was the only uh, Western Canadian conservative who actually outpolled the Reform Party in her riding. But the votes were split. So, But I think if a man had, had, had led that, the he would have got a second chance he you know would have been people would have made all sorts of excuses like you know it wasn't possible to win and now the new leader has to rebuild the party but when you're a woman one of the things is, is, is that you don't get a second chance because people look at your failure and say ah that validates my view that she didn't belong there that you know well and, and just on that point alone we've had 14 first ministers who have been female in Canada's history. Of yeah. the 14, only one has gone on to win re-election from their first election if they won. And Christy Clark, the uh, Premier of British Columbia, but then she was put into a minority situation and the Greens and the NDP came in and they formed a coalition government and kicked her out. Why do you think it's harder for women to win re-election in Canada? Well, I was at an event in Toronto a year or so ago uh, called No Second Chances, and it brought together many of the women who had been first ministers in the provinces and in the territories, and me as the only uh, federal uh, first minister. And it is interesting that for many of these women, their experience was not very happy um, because if they were, because often they would take over when things were very difficult. If things were going well, then the male, her, their male colleagues wanted the position. You know, if it was worth having, if they could win, you know, then, so they had, you know, knives in their back all the time. But all of the things, you know, sexism is not a matter of people saying, I don't believe in women. Nobody says that because it's politically incorrect. And nobody wants to be caught out. What sexism is is something much more subtle. It's the application of double standards. That for a woman, you know, as, as Charlotte Whitten, the first female mayor of Ottawa, once said, a woman has to be twice as good as a man in order to be thought half as good. But fortunately, that's easy. Uh, and I was brought up with Charlotte Whitten safe, so that perhaps gave me some courage. But the fact of the matter is that that that, that, that is how you're never getting never getting the benefit of the doubt. Like the election camp campaign of 1993, I remember my campaign chair saying, "You never got the benefit of the doubt." No, people would put words in my mouth. Uh, it's like people people who didn't weren't comfortable with me, and particularly the Ottawa Press Gallery, because you know they think they own the political process, and I didn't look or sound like anybody who'd done that job before. That's part of the problem when you're a woman; you come in to do it. 
and you don't fit the mold. You know, we know that, you know, by and large, it's helpful for men to be tall. You know, the, but the vast majority of CEOs, you know, in big American companies are, are, are taller than average. And, you know, there's this sort of this idea that a masculine physiognomy, uh, you know, big boys and all this stuff is equivalent to being a good leader, um, which is, you know, is you know, patently untrue. But if you're a woman and you come in and you don't look and sound like anybody who's done it before, then people try to find ways to validate their sense of discomfort. Um, but the only way to change that is to change what people are used to. So I look at somebody like Angela Merkel. You know, she's amazing. When I was, before I became leader of the party, I remember reading an article that somebody said, if a woman is going to be president of the United States, you know, she has to be brunette and she has to be this and that. I mean, all sorts of stuff that I wasn't. And, and I look at somebody like, you know, Angela Merkel, who doesn't wear skirts. Uh, you know, she has a, a wardrobe of an infinite variety of colored blazers and mostly dark pants. And uh, she, you know, she always looks neat and she believes that she, she, you know, she colors her hair and she says she thinks women should color their hair so she doesn't have gray hair. But she is not what anybody would have predicted was the physical model of somebody who could become the chancellor of Germany. And when she was elected leader of her party, I remember years ago, they weren't in government, and I remember saying to somebody, and I think it was one of my Club of Madrid members, a former president or prime minister, and I said, the German Christian Democrats have just elected a woman as their leader. Germany could have a female chancellor. And he said, oh, no, no, if, if they win, she won't be the chancellor, so and so will be the chancellor. And I thought, oh, I don't think so. So as women get into these positions, they reprogram our expectations of who gets to do that job and what that person looks and sounds like. And sometimes when they do it really well, like Angela Merkel or Jacinda Ardern in, in, in New Zealand or places like that, it redefines what people think a good leader is because now it looks and sounds like, like a woman. And by golly, you know, these women are doing things that the men couldn't do. So, but that's the only way you can get there. You can't do it in the abstract. You can't give students lessons in school. They'll vote and say, oh, okay, now I'm gonna vote for a woman. It's, a, it's pushing back and you have to understand that there is pushback. And the pushback is not just male chauvinist pigs. The pushback is a whole quite right-wing and conservative belief system for which the role of women as not enfranchised and not participating is fundamental to their worldview. Now, do you consider yourself a feminist? Oh yeah. What, I don't know what, another word for it. What what do you describe what is what is the meaning to Madam Campbell's feminist? What does feminist mean to Madam Campbell? Somebody who believes in the equality of women and is willing to advocate for it. I don't know another word for it. You know, I mean, a lot of, I know when I was, you know, company pause, a lot of young women say, oh, we don't want to use the F word. And I thought, you know, you use the other F word enough, but, uh, you know, this one is not so terrible. And I know men who are feminists, you know, and the prime minister has said he's a feminist. It just means somebody who recognizes that there is gender inequality in society. Being a feminist doesn't mean you think women are better than men. I mean, because that's a stupid, what a, you know, that's a kind of a, silly thing to do. I think men are wonderful and many of the most important people in my life, including my brilliant genius of a husband, you know, are men. And many of the people who've been my strongest supporters are men. And I remember when I was elected leader of the party, one of my strong male supporters being so excited and tears running down his face. And he said, this is for my daughter. These are men who get it. They have these brilliant young daughters and they want them to have every opportunity and that's actually one of the great radicalizing experiences for men sometimes is when their brilliant young daughters, you know, come out of law school or something and they can't get articles or they can't get a position. You know, can you imagine that Sandra Day O'Connor, uh, who became the first woman on the Supreme Court of the United States, couldn't get a job in a law firm when she was on top of her, I think she was second in her class at Stanford Law School. You know, she couldn't get a job. It, it, people thought they were doing her a favor, offering her a job as a legal secretary. So she now, said, screw that. And she followed a, a political 
So the question then has to be asked. Since since about early 2000, political parties during elections will come out with quotas. We have 20% women running for us. We have 30% women running for us. Do you believe that parties should be looking more at 50-50 split of men and women? Yeah, well, you know, the French, you know, the French who are not always on the front line, they have a law for parity, 50-50. And I think parity is is the, 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 the right term because you know, when we don't believe in that, we, it's like people that the default category is men and women are interlopers and women have to justify their place. And as opposed to the natural assumption that how can you have an effective government government, uh, and legislature governing your society, making the rules if half the people aren't there. And, you know, and I used to say that the reality of life as women live it is different from that of men. It doesn't mean that women can't represent men or men can't represent women. But it makes a difference when they're able, and they have to be enough of them that they can speak in their own voice. That well, they're not, they're on sufferance of being ersatz men. The reason I ask that is because if you traditionally look at where political parties have appointed or have gotten women to run, it's usually not in strong party ridings. They're usually in uh, ridings that you're t- typically not going to see that party win. So how well, do we oh, go, go ahead? Surprise, surprise. Yes, of course. That's called sexism. It's called tokenism. It's called, you know, hypocrisy. Um, and that is why I, a number of years ago, made a proposal that if we wanted to have parity in our elected bodies, we should have constituencies that elect both a man and a woman. When I was a member of the legislature in British Columbia, I was elected from Vancouver Point Grey. And in those days, the the big urban ridings in British Columbia, in Vancouver and Victoria, were two-member ridings. And two-member ridings actually have a very old history in Canada. They had them in the Maritimes, Prince Edward Island, Nova Scotia, elsewhere. And what, what they were originally created for was to balance Protestants and Catholics. So in every riding, I, I say a party would, would nominate both a Protestant and a Catholic. So if people voted, you know, gave the Liberals their vote, they would get both a Protestant and a Catholic. They eventually did away with them. I think most of them in the late 90s, and BC did away with them, uh, because that that reason didn't seem to be necessary anymore. Those divides were not there. Uh, I mean, it's hard for some people to remember that being a Catholic was a big deal, and uh, and that the Protestant Catholic divide was was one that was fraught with tension. Uh, it's not so much now, and it's interesting. I, I tell people that I am the first uh, Protestant prime minister since uh, Lester Pearson. And they go, oh. Because the assumption is, if it was a Quebec prime minister, he would be Catholic. But if it was a not a Quebec prime minister, he'd be, he'd be Protestant. But John Turner is a Catholic. Joe Clark is a Catholic. But the, what's interesting is that when I say these things, of course, Brian Mulroney is a Catholic, is that what's interesting is that people are surprised because it doesn't matter anymore. Nobody really cares. But there was a time when it did matter. So if we had constituencies that elected two people and every party nominated a man and a woman, now you'd still cast two ballots. You didn't, I mean, as, as we did when I ran, you don't have to vote for one, for both people from the same party. You could vote, in fact, when I was elected in Vancouver Point Grey, I won and, the, and, and an NDP candidate. I got the most votes. The second number of votes was Darlene Marzari, the NDP. So we had two different parties representing the same riding. So, but the point is you would have bingo, right from the start, you would have parity, gender parity. Now, people who are uncertain about their gender now, I mean, this sort of complicates things. People say, well, what about people who are non-binary, whatever? And I think, you know, you could say, well, pick one list and say who you are and run for it and fly it up the front. I mean, I'm not, I'm worried that that would undermine the whole idea of actually getting parity because, frankly, you'll have better policy towards transgender people. I think if you have more women in Parliament, I think they're just more humane and less uptight about these things. So, but the point is, if you had that, and, and you don't have to double the number of seats, you do use that wonderful Canadian institution, a royal commission, and you look at the boundaries of Canadian writings. When I was in Parliament, there were, I think, 285 seats Five, in yeah. Parliament. There are now 340-something. So the number of seats in Parliament has grown. 
Why? I don't know. The American House of Representatives is uh, is, is frozen at, I think, 450, is it 415 or 425? Anyway, it can grow. So with, if the population grows or grows in different areas, they have re, they redraw the boundaries. They don't add to them. So that number of, of, of seats serves maybe three times as many people as it did when it was first established. So there's no magic number. So you choose what is the optimal number of ridings. Then you work at what is the most equitable way of drawing the boundaries, because you'll have larger constituencies if you're going to have, you know, if you're not going to have 500 people, uh, and you'll need to find what are the ways to recognize that we sometimes uh, overrepresent people from large, low populated your, your rural areas, et cetera. I mean, these are things, I mean, it's not rocket science, it's science and it's, you know, good sense and fairness to figure it out. But then you would have automatically, you would have parity. And there would be no excuse not to have parity in cabinets because the prime minister would have the same number of, of women as men to choose from. And, you know, seems to me that that, and that keeps women and men from fighting with each other. It keeps the vicious fights at the riding level and enables the ridings to still have control over their nominations because you don't have the prime minister parachuting in, uh, you know, an unrepresented candidate, an ethnic, a woman or whatever. In terms of other forms of, of diversity, that you work out at that level. Uh, and maybe even within a, 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 a ticket that you present in a riding, you might have, you know, a man of color and a, and a white woman or, you know, in other words, you can you can play around with that to, to uh, enlarge the diversity uh, of your caucus. But the point is, uh, we need something and people don't like the, like the idea of quotas. But that's because, it, you know, it's like programs in the United States where people don't like social welfare programs, they're afraid that black people are going to get stuff. It's all very racist underneath. And this notion that somehow if you have quotas, you're undeserving people are getting elected, even though there's huge amounts of nepotism and, you know, <laughs> insider dealing, etc. that gets these things. I mean, you think this is all a fair meritocracy, forget it. But if you had this, uh, I think it would be a powerful statement if Canada said, as a fundamental principle of our democracy, we believe that elected bodies should equally reflect men and women. They should also reflect other people, and parties need to uh, make an effort. And maybe there would be next steps one could take. You know, should there be, uh, I mean, because we have uh, the territories now, Nunavut and the Northwest Territories, et cetera, with, with indigenous people running the governments, we're now getting more indigenous people coming into parliament. So that's one of the ways of, of helping to increase that representation from those areas anyway. Uh, there's more, it wouldn't solve every problem about the fairness of our, of our electoral system. But quotas are a kind of a, 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 of a code word that can be used to suggest that undeserving people are going to get a chance, as opposed to really deserving people are finally going to get a chance to buck the established order. And I must say what that I, I love, and I've quoted this often, um, that when Prime Minister Trudeau appointed his gender balanced cabinet first time out, and he was traveling in another country and the prime minister there said, or president whoever, said to him, why did you appoint 50-50 females, 50-50 male females, why didn't you just put it on merit? And he said, if I'd appointed on merit, I'd have had more women. And, you know, think about it. You know, men are not the default category. And gender equality could actually work very well for men. In the same way that the Norwegians, they have a rule that publicly traded companies must have boards of directors that have no fewer than 40% of either sex. So you can have 60% men, 40% women, 60% women, 40% men. You can't have 75% women and 25% men. In other words, but the way they phrase it, it doesn't say you gotta have a certain number of women, you say no more than 40%, no fewer than 40% of each sex must be there. What you do with the other 20% is your business. Now, when you were appointing your cabinet, when you won the leadership, you appointed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and quote me if I'm wrong here, five female ministers. Yeah. I made Why cabinet did, much smaller. Pardon me? I reduced the size of cabinet dramatically. But, so why didn't you try and make parity there? Why didn't you I try didn't, and... I couldn't then. There weren't enough. You know, I mean, that was the thing. I mean... It's a great idea. In 1993, it wasn't really doable. Uh, what I did do was reduce the size of cabinet quite dramatically. And I had to build on who was already there 
I mean, we hadn't had an election, so I had to deal with, and again, in an immediate post-leadership uh, government creation, you have to, there's a lot of political considerations. But, you know, one time Brian Mahoney, you know, when he was prime minister before, first of all, he had a bigger caucus. Uh, he had more women to choose from, but he only had six women in cabinet, even though he had a much bigger cabinet and, man, and many more to choose from. So, because a lot of the, my female colleagues weren't running again. So, so, you know, yes, I would have got there. But the other thing is, it also works well when men do it. You know, do you really have to have a female prime minister to do this? If men do it, it becomes sort of, you know, a no-brainer. And that's why men need to step up to the plate. If I were prime minister now, I'd have no difficulty doing it. Do you think you would have won if the leadership of the PC party was today? Do you think you would have won it still? Or not to, well, the PC party doesn't exist today. If it was still around, hypothetically, if the party did not join with the Conservatives and you had just been an up-and-coming MP, do you think you'd still be able to win that election with everything that goes on in today's society with the rise of social media, with the views of how women are perceived? Do you think you'd be able to do it? Because uh, it's, going to get, it's going to get into my next question. Well, 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 I mean, what's complicated is, you know, what is your party's base? Um, you know, I mean, the, the Conservative Party, in a sense, tried to incorporate the Reform Party. And many of the people f who found that uh, unpalatable then went to the Liberals or other parties. Uh, I think what, what was sort of surprising in 93 is that people would vote for parties that couldn't form a government. So the vote for Reform and the vote for the Bloc Québécois, it, on one level didn't make sense, but they made sense to the people who voted for them. So the Quebec electorate is always complicated. And now, and when Quebecers aren't happy, they, they gravitate towards their regional party. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question because uh, it's a complicated one. Um, I think there are some things that would have made it easier for me, um, but I don't know. It was it was a very different... And also, I, I didn't have time, you know, I was elected and... I didn't have time to govern, really. You know, I created a new, my creation of the, of the slim down cabinet was incredibly popular. And in the summer of '93, Gallup reported that I had the highest approval rating for a prime minister in 30 years. So there was a lot of popularity of it, but there was also a lot of anger. People were very angry at Brian Mulroney. They were angry at our government for doing things. And if I had had a year to govern. And to present to the Canadian people a new vision for a progressive conservative government, I think it might have been a fairer contest. Not sure, fairer. It would have been a, a more informed contest. But I didn't have time to do that. And so, in a sense, I was in the difficult position of succeeding somebody who was the most unpopular prime minister in the history of Canadian polling. And that's what I never criticized him during the election. But he was very much disliked, and you know, Sheila Copps called me, you know, Mulroney in a skirt, and all this. I mean, it was there was a whole set of circumstances that made it very difficult. I would have made it very difficult for anyone who was leading our party. So, and then in addition to that, there was all the underpinning of the gender stuff, and I don't talk about it all that much because it sounds self-serving. But there's been a lot of interesting scholarly literature now. Uh, Linda Trimble, who's a political scientist at the University of Alberta, published a book at the end of 2017 called Madam PM, which is about the media treatment of me, the first two women pri uh, prime ministers of New Zealand, Jenny Shipley and Helen Clark, and uh, Julia Gillard in Australia. And when she gave me a copy of the book, she said, you know, I was so mad when I was doing the research about how you were treated during the leadership. And, you know, because, you know, this 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 metaphor of the tortoise and the hare. Now, if, if you're in a race of where people are describing it as the tortoise and the hare, and you are the hare, you are by definition a kind of undeserving jerk. And, you know, it's very, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a metaphor because you, you use horse races, but because I was so far ahead in the leadership stakes, uh, they tried to find another way of describing it. You know, it wasn't the dark horse or coming up in the stretch or, you know, gaining on the outside or anything. It was, so they used the tortoise and the hare. And John Sherry was a tortoise and I was the hare. But just think about that, what that means. It's a very unflattering and undermining 
metaphor to use. And she was, anyway, she was so much how mad she was. So I got the book and I foolishly read that chapter and it made me mad too. And I thought, you know, well, you know, I'm not somebody who lives with old grudges. But what's also interesting is to see how powerful the the framing of a campaign can be. And again, if if people don't think you belong, they will look for ways to validate that sense. And that's why you don't get the benefit of the doubt. Anything you say or do, even if it's not what you actually said, if it can be attributed to you and ascribed to you, uh, you know, it, it takes on a life of its own. And that's even worse in the days of social media. Now, like I said in uh, previously, a previous, um, we have we've had fourteen first ministers that are women. One that is currently serving the premier of Northwest Territories is the only uh, female premier in Confederation right now. Uh, Madam uh, Campbell, do you see a day when we could potentially have thirteen first ministers at the same time? Well, there was a time when we had quite a few. We had about five at one point. Um, you know, it's the luck of the draw. People say to me, what does it take for a woman to be prime minister of Canada? I said, you have to be elected leader of a party that has a possibility to form a government. And those leadership campaigns don't happen all the time. So it's not something that's new every campaign. Um, and women have to be positioned to do it. Um, if they are... And often women are expected to have more experience. I mean, men come in from the outside. Brian Mulroney became leader of the Conservative Party. He never had elected office. He became prime minister after serving a year as leader of the opposition. He had never run a ministry. He had never And I think it actually showed the first two years of his prime ministership. I don't think he was used to the kind of heat that he was going to take as prime minister. And that woman who said, you know, goodbye, Charlie Brown. I mean, that really threw him for a loop. By the time I got to Ottawa, I was so used to that. I mean, I been a school trustee and sat in school gyms being yelled at by teachers and stuff. You know, I mean, school board politics is really fractious and it's a good training ground. But, um, you know, I think with women, I mean, Christian Freeland, a lot of people have a high regard for her. Um, you know, the loss of Jane Philpott and Jody wilson Rabel, those were two high-profile people in the Liberal Party who are gone from contention at this point. Um, I was sorry Ronna Ambrose didn't run for leader of the, of the Conservative Party. I thought she did a, an extremely good job as interim leader of the opposition. So, you know, when the, when the chance arises, you know, somebody who can capture the imagination needs to be there and ready to do it. But what worries me is if women feel that it's just too hard. Uh, or that the uh, the price isn't worth it, and that's why people have to rally around and say we're not going to tolerate, you know, BS and misogyny directed towards our, our our leaders. But you know, in Alberta, you know, there was a woman who, who crossed the floor from the, the conservatives to the NDP because of how she was treated in her own party. So, you know, it's not okay. And what worries me about resurgent authoritarianism, and I include Donald Trump in that, is that Donald Trump gives people permission to you know, rehash and bring back some of the old rhetoric that we hoped had died in the legal and social reforms of the 60s and 70s. And, you know, if you, you know, if life isn't going so well for you, I mean, Lyndon Johnson once said, if the poorest white man feels that he is better off than a black man, he'll give you his vote. And if you can convince him that, you know, that makes him superior to the black man, he'll be your supporter forever. So you don't have to actually do anything for him. You just have to make him feel that he's got more than the black person. And I think it's the same way, you know, with women. If you can make people feel that you're that you're better, that men are better. And it scares me when I see the stuff and that moron at Google who wrote that paper about women not being cut out for tech, when in fact that whole field, what many of its most important pioneers were women, but he didn't know, he was ignorant, it was totally wrong. And, you know, happily he was fired uh, because it was it totally, it wasn't just that he was, it wasn't he was politically incorrect, it was that he was wrong. And his comments were slanderous, were libelous if they were written. And, you know, unacceptable. So we have to not allow that kind of stuff. But it, it makes some people, you know, it's a, it's a shortcut to feeling superior. And it makes me sad that, that some men feel they need it. Because, you know, my life is full of wonderful men. And 
you know, I think men are great and I like them in all their different forms and, you know, activities and, you know, whether it's a, you know, a rustic, you know, woodsman or, a, you know, a scholar or a musician or a business person. I mean, men are like women. They come in all different uh, uh, roles and, and configurations and, you know, they're great. But they're not the only people who are great because there's a whole bunch of women who are also great. Now, uh, my last question for you, Madam Campbell, um, as an admirer of yours, since I was in, uh, I was growing up and watching that 1993 leadership election, I still have a Kim Campbell button that goes on my Christmas tree every year. Uh, it's right beside Joe Clark's and Brian Mulroney. So uh, I, I, I have to ask the question. Um, and for the admirers out there, the young boys and young girls who are looking at you as their icon, their idol that you didn't have as a young uh, woman growing up in BC, what do you say to them in today's world? And if they're thinking about getting into politics, what would you say to them? Well, first of all, one of my most fundamental values is the importance of democracy. Churchill was right, it's the worst form of government except for all the others that have been tried. Uh, but democracy is hard work, and it, but it matters. And I, again, I go back to my experience of my parents being in uniform in World War II and working to defeat Hitler, who was the anti-democrat, who wanted to undermine all of the protections of the rule of law, all of the, the values that enable us to live with people who aren't like us. You know, what is democracy? It's a form of government that enables us to live uh, peacefully with people we don't necessarily like or agree with. That isn't the point of the world is to all think alike. We can't. And if we all think alike, we're going to miss big issues. We're all going to fall off the cliff because we're all going to say, oh, this is the way to go. So I would say to every young, young boy and girl, every young man and woman, see democracy and democratic politics as, first of all, a precious part of your heritage, something that was bought for and paid, bought and paid for, with a lot of sacrifice. The sacrifice of people uh, in their lives in Canada, the sacrifice of people who went to wars, and however stupid you can think wars can be, and and you know the carnage of the First World War, and you know. Uh, how you know, people wanted it to be the war to end all wars, and how many young people, and particularly young men, have paid a price. Uh, as I say, my father's best friend, Leo Charbonneau, was killed by a sniper in northern Italy, and his I, I have a home in Italy, and his grave is in the Canadian War Cemetery in Ravenna, and I have a picture of it. And you know, he never got a chance to live. So for all the people who never got a chance, those of us who've had a chance, we have to respect and cherish and value what they made it possible for us to have. And if we are cynical, or if we are too lazy to be citizens and to make our democratic system work and to constantly work to improve it, then we are betraying those and we are in deep peril because the instruments of democracy can also be used to undermine it. People can elect somebody like a Donald Trump who is setting about not only destroying all the environmental regulations and allowing people to do things that poison water and increase you know, health risks and all sorts of stuff uh, that are just not in the interest of Americans and engage in stupid trade wars and impoverish the people who voted for them, et cetera, et cetera, but undermining the rule of law. And he is, and he is enablers who are working with him to re, to remove what everybody thought would keep him in, in, in check, which was the checks and balances inherent in the American Constitution. Nothing is forever unless we protect it. And in Canada, we're not perfect. There are lots of challenges. And we have, you know, we're as racist and, and bigoted as any other country. But we try. We try to create laws and our charter and things to protect people, to give people recourse. We have these institutions, and you know, I always say people who want to run for municipal politics, that's a great place to start. Because you learn everything, you do everything, budgeting, policy, labor relations, all that stuff. And you work face to face with the people you serve, so they're not, politics isn't an abstract exercise. Real flesh and blood people are affected by what you do. And when you get a chance to serve, I think of when I was in the legislature and I chaired uh, committees going around the province, meeting with people to you know, gain information about certain policy areas. 
and how many wonderful people I met. Or when I was a school trustee and parents would come to meet with me because they had children who had learning disabilities or problems and they wanted the best for their children. And I would see what heroic lives people live and how people, you know, I would, it was an honor to meet with these people. You know, I would, there would be we'd my problem Wednesday from four to five when I met with them, but these were issues they lived with 24 seven and how committed they were to making life good for their children. So what I'm saying is that when you get involved in public life, you actually will often see the heroic lives that people live that notwithstanding they have problems and they come to you with these problems and you will learn about things because we only know our own reality. Uh, when you I remember my, my colleague Frank Oberle used to say going, being in Parliament is like going to the best university in the world. And I was talking to a teacher, I'm going to do a little video for my old high school the graduation because nobody's got graduations now. And we were talking about, you know, looking at my report card and how grade 11 social studies was about Canada when I did it. But it was so boringly taught and whatever that I had to actually get involved in politics to fall in love with my country again and come to have an appreciation for its complexity and difficulty and uh, and the orneriness of Canadians as well as the uh, the the greatness of Canadians. You know, we're a very interesting country. So the short answer to your question is, if you don't engage in politics, and you don't necessarily have to be a candidate, you know, you can try elected office or try these things and see if it suits your temperament. Not everybody likes that. But bottom line vote. Secondly, you want more women in politics? Spread a check. Support somebody's campaign. Um, you know, put out the lawn sign. Talk to your neighbors. Make democracy your project uh, as just as a citizen. And never be too busy to be a citizen. And that's how we protect our freedom and our ability to be all the things we want to be and to be obnoxious and difficult. Because that's that's really one of the signs of freedom, is the ability, ability to be an ass and not be sent to jail for it. You know, the, the Chinese are now cracking down on Hong Kong, which is a whole other thing, terrible tragedy, because they pass a law to make it a crime to make fun of the Chinese anthem. Now, I don't think I'd be happy if, you know, Canadians making, I mean, although I was involved in a process to try and get the, 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 the Canadian anthem made more gender equal, so instead of all thy sons to com command, say all of us command, which is closer actually to the original words. But frankly, I never thought that people who disagreed with me on that subject or anybody who maybe didn't like our anthem should go to jail. You know, what's that about? So it matters. It really matters. There can be a great deal of joy associated with it. Being involved, in there can be a lot of frustration. There can be anguish, but that's called life. Uh, you know, I don't know how you can live a life without ever having any pain or disappointment. Um, that's true. So, um, and, you know, and I have survived. You know, I had a terrible electoral defeat, and a lot of people wanted to, you know, put it all on me, too. That was the thing. If you're the woman, you're, you know, if you succeed, you're a genius. If you fail, it's all you. Um, but you know what? I have a very happy life. I'm worried as hell about the world. I'm worried about the state of democracy. I'm worried about climate change. I'm worried about the future of the planet. But my personal life is very happy. And I have the great pleasure in being able to meet and talk to women, old women, young women. Uh, and if they are encouraged by my life, that's deeply satisfying to me, even though it's a life of many ups and downs. That's perfect. Madam Prime Minister, I want to thank you very much for this. Um, it's been an honor. It's been a privilege. And uh, I, I, I look forward. And if I'm not mistaken, you are currently writing a book. Well, I'm, I'm petering around it. I'm now actually thinking I might try and do some more kind of video blogging kind of stuff. I don't know. I mean, I, I have things I want to say, and the question is whether I have the, the patience to actually write another book or not. But. Well, I want to thank you once again for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I, I, I always, every time I listen to your uh interviews with reporters interviews or speeches I, I get a sense of pride that you have in this country so thank you very much my pleasure thank you for being part of a national conversation good on you 
Thank you once again for listening to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. If you love this episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast, head over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast and subscribe, rate us, and leave us a review. All the links to our social media accounts are in the show notes or visit www.crossborderinterviews.ca. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced and edited by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Be sure to tune in next Saturday for our next episode of the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Once again, thank you and see you next week. Bye-bye.